Hello and welcome to the course. I'm your host today, Lee, and I'm speaking with Assistant Professor Luis Martinez from the Harris School of Public Policy. He researches the interaction between economics and politics in developing countries with a regional focus on Latin America. Professor Martinez is here to talk to us about his career path and how he became a University of Chicago professor. Welcome to the course, Professor Martinez. It's great to have you here with us today. Thank you for having me. Can you give me a sense of your career path, beginning in your undergraduate years, all the way to becoming a professor at the University of Chicago? For sure. It's been a bit of a long road, I would say. So I want to call it back home, in my hometown of Bogota, Colombia. I attended Universidad de los Andes. I majored in economics and philosophy. I also did my master's there and I worked as a research assistant. You know, I spent like 10 years of my life there. And then I went to the United Kingdom where I did my PhD in economics at the London School of Economics. And when I finished, I moved to Chicago where I've been working at the Harris School of Public Policy at the University of Chicago for the past six years, almost today, actually. I think I moved to the US like July 13, 15, 2016. Could you tell me about your research interests? So my research sits at the intersection of economics and political science. So as economists, we're interested in understanding how the economy works, how markets work, how resources are assigned across different uses. And for the past, there's a longer tradition, but certainly for the past 30 years or so, there's been growing interest among economists in understanding the role that political factors play in all of these processes. We think that, for instance, the government is a major consumer of goods and services and it employs a ton of people. And so we want to understand, and of course, governments are driven by political calculations, political strategy. And so we want to understand how these political motivations, political factors affect how the government works and how this has repercussions throughout the economy. Luis, you grew up in Bogota, is that correct? That is correct. And what were you like as a little kid and what did you want to be when you grew up? As a kid, I was always a nerd. I was always the, the nerdiest kid in my class. I guess I grew up in the late 80s, so I was influenced by the, maybe I watched too many Indiana Jones movies, but I wanted to be an archaeologist. Although I will confess that it wasn't because of the heroics and the adventure and so on. It was more the nerdier side of me. Like, I think I enjoyed more when like Indiana Jones was able to like get a hold of like these really antique objects, explore it and so on. So as a kid, I wanted to be an archaeologist, but that didn't last long. Then for a while, I wanted to be a journalist. I guess I just enjoyed reading, writing, learning about different things. And then at some point, I guess it must have been like 14 or so, I started thinking about becoming an economist, that I had a close relative who was an economist. And these decisions, it's not like we make this calculated long run plan about where we want to be. The major decisions in people's lives are driven by this kind of serendipitous factor. So for me, I had the influence of a close relative who was an economist and was this amazing guy. Like I would love going to his house. He would have so many books, you know, literature, history, everything. He would talk about all of these things. And so I think it was very much that influence that made me think, okay, this is the person I want to be like. This person is an economist and that's what I will be. So Luis, you said that you've always been quite a nerd. I wonder, does that mean when you were in middle and high school, were you, you know, a very studious kind of person? Were you a good student? What were you like in those years of your life? I guess I was a bit of a mix because, yes, I was certainly a good student, you know, very dedicated to my studies. But at the same time, like my group of friends were not necessarily as nerdy as I was. So I would get into trouble occasionally, more for like little disciplinary things here and there and so on. So my friends, they allowed me to have a bit of a balance. Like I would study hard Monday through Thursday and then have a bit of fun with friends Friday, Saturday and so on. But yes, certainly the nerdy type. You know, it's interesting to me that you knew you wanted to be an economist when you were in your early teenage years. And you mentioned that was because of the influence of a close relative. Why do you think that 
ambition, that particular career focus stuck? What was it about economics, you think, that has really drawn you to it, even as you've grown into an adult and have left your high school years far behind? I, I guess that it is because it was indeed a good fit for me in terms of, because of course, when you're 14 and you say, I want to be this or I want to be that, like you don't really understand the implications, you know, what the day to day is and what you actually do. I feel that in my case, and this applies even to like when I went to do my PhD, I've been lucky enough that the things I think I want to do, once I actually get there and I start doing them, I realize that I do enjoy them massively and that I'm good at it. So I guess it, it, this was the case with, with economics. I kind of went into it not knowing very much what it would be like. But then, you know, it fitted my interests really well. It had a bit of math. I enjoyed math. It had a bit to do with history, with politics. To be honest, as I was saying earlier, when I described my research, you know, I'm, I am not the conventional economist. If you ask me about the inflation rate or unemployment or something like that, I will struggle to give you like a very compelling answer. But economics these days is this amazing diversified field where we, you know, we can use this set of tools to study questions that many people would not even think are within the realm of economics. And so given that I had these interests in history, politics, like very broad, very diverse, I think it was a good fit for me, fortunately. Luis, were there any obstacles that you encountered along the way to becoming an academic, to becoming a professor? There certainly were. It's not easy. It's gotten increasingly difficult. But even back then, academia is a challenging career. It's very competitive. There's lots of steps along the way. And especially for someone in my situation, say, growing up in another country, and trying to, you know, go to an American or a British university and, you know, and start a career there, it's certainly a bit more challenging. I don't think it comes as a surprise if I tell you that if you do your undergrad at Stanford or Harvard or the University of Chicago, doors open up and you meet people and things evolve in a way that is a bit different if you're coming from outside. So naturally, there were additional challenges along the way. In my case, additionally, I don't think I made life easy for myself in the sense that it's not like I had this master plan. You know, it's not like when I was 16, I said, okay, when I'm 30 something, I want to be a professor at the University of Chicago. What's the best path to get there? But it was more like learning by doing like, okay, I got into economics. I majored in economics. Then I started interacting with faculty and I realized, oh, okay, this is fun. I started working as an RA. At some point, I said, I want to do a PhD. And so, of course, it, I would say it's, a, it's much more fun, probably, than if you have like a grand scheme for your life. But certainly, it ends up happening that at certain points in the road, you realize, oh, gosh, maybe I should have done things differently, you know, three decisions ago. Where three decisions ago can be five years ago, you know, when I was deciding what courses to take in, in my undergrad, maybe I should have taken more math classes, that type of thing. So, so for me, the, I don't know whether to call it the improvised nature, which in which things have unfolded have certainly, you know, uh, have made things more fun, but a tad more challenging, uh, at times. And who would you say are the most important people in your life who've helped you overcome and continue to pursue this career in spite of those challenges? I would say those people have to be my wife and my daughter. When I started my PhD, my daughter was four, five years old, and my wife was finishing her medical career back home in Colombia. And basically, I talked them both. I guess my daughter was five, so it wasn't that hard. My wife was willing to put her career on hold and follow me to the UK to do my PhD, where, and of course, you know, as a physician, it is hard to move around. There's regulations, exams. So it's not the best career to be jumping around countries. But my wife was there every step of the way, you know, supported me throughout the PhD. And then when I graduated, when I finished the PhD, for us, the easiest thing to do would have been to go back home because since my wife's medical degree was from Colombia, of course, she could just go back home and, you know, start return to her career much more easily. 
But at the time, this amazing opportunity arose of joining the University of Chicago. And it was the type of thing that you just couldn't say no. I'm a big soccer fan. So I would tell my wife, this is like if Real Madrid or Barcelona wants you to play for them. It's a once in a lifetime opportunity. You cannot say no to this. And my wife agreed to being in the UK for five, six years to then, okay, let's move again to a brand new country and start anew. And by then my daughter was about to enter middle school. She was no longer like a small child. And so to take her away, you know, from her friends and she was very happy in London, but she was also willing to do it. Fortunately, she's about to graduate from the laboratory schools, the school of the University of Chicago, where, which is an amazing school where she has been incredibly happy. And my wife now works as a physician here in the U.S. So those were challenging decisions where it's not just you thinking about what's best for you, but they are decisions that affect people that you love and that you care about. And in my case, I've been fortunate enough that my family has always been there for me, has always been supportive. And, you know, without them, it just wouldn't have been possible. And to say one more thing about the role of family, when I was doing the PhD, maybe we'll talk about this some more later on, but... A PhD is difficult. It's a bit of a lonely experience where you're finding your way, you're learning how to do research. And even though you have a network of like your advisor and your peers and so on, it's, it's challenging, you know, emotionally and physically. And so for me also at that point, not just the critical junctures of should we live here or not, but throughout the process of say the PhD and now as an assistant professor, it's always been nice to have like a, a good work-life balance and to have like a support network that, you know, at the end of the day, I can go home and I can disconnect a bit from work. You know, I can talk about other things, have fun with my family. So yes, these two people have been the bedrock for me. I appreciate that reflection. And why become a professor and academic? Because I know with your expertise as an economist, you could do other things. And to follow up that question, have you done other things besides be a professor? As soon as I finished college, I applied for a few jobs and I got one actually working for the government, for the Colombian government. And so I went there, I was still doing my master. So I would come to the university like once a week. I was just writing my dissertation at that point, pretty much. And I worked for the government for like 10 months. This must have been, I started say January of 2008. And by October, I was thinking like, I have to get out of here. And you know, every day, every time that I would go back to the university, I would just think this is where I want to be. This is a much more enjoyable environment to be. So sometimes nowadays I tell my students, I, I joke around and I tell them, look, I've only been to the real world sporadically. So what I tell you may be correct or may not be correct because my real world experience is a bit limited. I've been uh, shielded within a university for a very long time. And so I worked for the government for like 10 months. And then very soon afterwards, I just went back to my university, Los Andes, back home where I started working as a research assistant, as an adjunct professor. I started teaching classes and I haven't stopped since then. So Luis, you mentioned before that economics is a pretty broad field. There's a lot of different things that you can study under the umbrella of economics. When and how did you decide that you wanted to look at that interaction between economics and politics and focus that research on Latin America? That came pretty early on, I think. For me, it was clear that the big, the big economic questions that I was interested in, that I am interested in, like say something as simple as why are some countries much richer than, other, than others? Why is there so much inequality? This type of questions. To me, it became clear very early on that historical and political factors play a crucial role. I guess part of the story maybe has to do with the fact that my colleague at Harris, James Robinson, who is one of the most prominent scholars in my field of research, he visits Los Andes every year and he, he gives a summer class and he's very nice to students that are thinking of pursuing a career in academia and so on. So I guess for me, when I was finishing my undergrad, doing my master's, there was certainly a strong influence of, okay, here at Los Andes, we're good at political economy. You know, this, these are the important questions. And that resonated with interest I had from the past that coming from a country like Colombia, it's relatively easy to give a certain 
importance and a certain prominence to these factors. You know, we're we're a country with a with a complex political history, with a history of conflict, with a history of violence, and so it's hard to be an economist and to abstract away from these things and to think, yeah, here's economics on this side, but then the conflict and politics and parties and, you know, an institutional weakness that these are disconnected things. So for me, it was very natural. Like, I guess there were, there were topics that I was interested in that I had read about growing up again, the Colombian conflict being a prominent example. And so as I became more and more interested in economics, it was kind of natural for me to just put these things together. And Luis, now that you are in this incredible position, as you mentioned, you got this opportunity of a lifetime to be an assistant professor at the University of Chicago. I wonder what are your future goals for your career? I would say that I'm at a point in my career where I just enjoy my work so much that I can easily see myself continuing to do more of the same for the foreseeable future, you know, working on new research projects which of course you benefit from experience. So as time goes on, you know, you get to, you become better at picking ideas that, that are more and more interesting to you, but at the same time where you think you can make a bigger contribution, you know, study things that will be of interest to other people. Also other aspects like teaching, advising students as you progress in the career, PhD students and master's students become a bit more interested in working with you. And that is certainly one of the joys of the job, you know, when you reach that point where it's not just you that is developing as a scholar, but where you get to see other very talented people grow around you. And to think that, you know, you can play a role, even if it's a small role in shaping how these people think, how they do their job, that that's a wonderful feeling. What are the most fun parts of being a professor? I love all of it. I really enjoy the day to day. Like I also enjoy taking time off in the weekend, resting, you know, doing some exercise, going for a nice meal. But say when it's Sunday evening, I've heard that some people get stressed out about, oh my gosh, tomorrow is morning and I have to get back to work, back into the office. But for me, usually it's more like Friday evening. I left off in this really interesting place where, you know, I think we are, you know, I think we're getting some results on this project that we've been working on for months or some new piece of data just arrived and we haven't had time to look at it thoroughly. And so to me, like Sunday evening, I actually get excited about, okay, tomorrow I can go back to work. I can look at these things. So that's fun. Like I said earlier, interacting with students, it's just amazing to be in an environment where everyone is intellectually curious, where everyone is producing knowledge, asking questions. And at that, to be honest, the University of Chicago has no rival. The, the less fun bit is it's hard. As I mentioned earlier, it's not easy. There's a lot of challenges along the road, a lot of rejection. You know, you just get used to being rejected for everything. You know, you, you apply for PhDs, you get rejected from some. Once you are in the PhD, you apply for jobs, you get rejected from some. You send your papers to conferences, you get rejected from some. You submit your papers for publication, you get... So it's almost like you put all of this effort, you pour your heart into it. And there's, of course, at the end of the day, say, for instance, if you're working on a research project, like all of this rejection and the feedback from, say, peer review and so on, to be honest, in my experience, at the end of it, you realize this project actually looks much better thanks to the input of all of these people, or you publish a paper and you feel like, yeah, I think this is a great home for this paper. It's actually better than this other place I tried first. You certainly need to develop a thick skin because yeah, it's challenging. It's built into the nature of the job and the profession. The idea that we're always asking questions. We're always looking for holes in people's arguments, in people's evidence. But of course that can take a toll. You put your heart into your work. You go, you present, people ask a bunch of difficult questions and they always tell you, don't take it personally. It's like your little baby. Your ideas are like your little babies. And so it's hard to, it, it can be, it can be a bit taxing at times, but if you're passionate and you love it, you just, you learn to deal with it. So you would say that rejection and constructive criticism, you know, as constructive as it might be, are some of the harder and less fun elements of your job? Certainly. Yeah. And, you know, and sometimes it's like you have some projects, you have some due date for a grant or a submission and you work super hard and, you know, and you submit it and you think like, okay, I don't have to think about this for some days or some weeks. And then at some point you hear back and it's a no. 
And then it's like, oh my gosh, you feel like you're back in square one. And so, yes, I certainly think that is the hardest bit. As I mentioned earlier, say when you're a grad student, that is also hard because it's so challenging. Like the, it's a very unstructured adventure doing a PhD. Like the image that I like to use is when you're doing a master's, say like a master of public policy, like the one we have at the Harris School, there's a lot of structure. It's like if you like climbing and you go to one of these indoor climbing walls and you know how there's all the little pegs with colors. And so even though it's super hard, still there's a sense of, okay, my right hand should go here. And after I put my hand here, now my left foot should go up here. Even though it's challenging, there's a structure that allows you to climb yourself up. When you're doing a PhD, it's more like Mount Everest. There's like snow and a blizzard everywhere. And it's like, okay, the top of the mountain is over there, figure it out. And so certainly that lack of structure, you know, especially at the beginning, it can be, it can be a bit of a difficult cocktail, the combination of this incessant supply of feedback and rejection combined with being at a point in your professional trajectory where just where you're just figuring things out. And so, of course, there's like a lot of self-doubt and a lot of imposter syndrome and that type of thing. But I think it's just a matter of realizing that it's a stage and that you just have to like power through it. Like you fell today, you just pick yourself back up and you keep going. You know, you've already offered some extremely valuable advice to people pursuing a similar field, but what other advice would you have for people who are interested in becoming an academic and specifically working in the field of economics? I have two pieces of advice, and I think they're a bit mutually inconsistent, but here it goes. On the one hand, I would say planning ahead. I guess I'm going to sound very old when I say this. Back in the days when I was applying to grad school and so on, I feel like there, there wasn't as much information available as there is now about what an academic job looks like, about what the expectations for admission into graduate school are, what does the, yeah, all of these different things. So certainly, given how hard it is, it, it is certainly a good idea to spend time and effort figuring things out and planning out a bit so that down the line, you don't feel like, oh, I should have done this differently. I should have done more of this, less of that. But at the same time, as I was telling you earlier, I feel that part of what has made the journey much more enjoyable to me, this is part two of the advice, I guess, is I wouldn't want to say not taking it so seriously, but like not being, not trying to be so controlling about things. Like, you know, going with the flow a bit. Maybe I said this already, but when I went to do my PhD, to be honest, it never crossed my mind that one day I would be working at the University of Chicago. In fact, when I went to do my PhD, I was very influenced from my, from the faculty back home who were, you know, my bosses as a research assistant and so on. And I would very much think like, I love the lives that these people have. I love the jobs. I love what they do. I want to be fortunate enough to just come back home and work back home. Like, you know, my biggest aspiration when I went to do the PhD was, I hope I'm able to get a nice job back home. It never crossed my mind to be at a place like the University of Chicago. And I feel that when I was doing the PhD, you know, dealing with, again, all of this learning process and so on, I think it would, I, it would have made life harder. I would have been life more difficult for myself if on top of that, I was thinking, oh, and I want to get a job at this super prestigious, amazing institution. So the two pieces of advice, that, like I said, are a bit mutually inconsistent because on the one hand, you should do a bit of planning, a bit of research, but on the other hand, you shouldn't try to be like so controlling and have it all as figured out. Just enjoy the ride. I guess one, one way to be concrete about that would be if you're entering academia, if you're doing a PhD, really focus on finding a topic that you're passionate about that you're interested about, not just focusing on, you know, what is, what is sexy in the profession right now? You know, what, what are people working on that seems to be getting a lot of attention and a lot of publications? It's not going to work. If you're not studying things that you really care and you're passionate about, it's not going to work. And so I think it's better to try to be a bit more authentic and just do what you're interested in and wherever it takes you. 
I've been speaking with Assistant Professor Luis Martinez. Professor, thank you for your time. And course takers, if you enjoyed listening to today's interview, please check out the other ones. You can find out more about the University of Chicago through uchicago.edu or the university's campus in Hong Kong through uchicago.hk. Thanks for listening.